So today we're going to be talking about hip range of motion assessment, specifically looking at passive range of motion assessment with goniometric measurement. Now, prior to doing this, hopefully you would have already completed a lower extremity screen. And I'll link that video into this one so that you can review that if you've not already watched it. That portion is typically done in either a seated position or a standing position. So once you've completed that, you're then ready to perform the passive range of motion assessment with or without goniometric range of motion measurement. We're going to presume that you've completed those steps, and so we're going to dive straight in. So the first thing you need to do is you need to get your patient uh, into a supine position. You need to make sure that you have a goniometer handy and available, and then you need to know what different motions you want to formally assess. I find it's helpful to keep the goniometer in the back pocket. If you're wearing a pair of pants um, or have clothing that does not have that available, you can also just set it on the treatment table and grab it as need be. From here, uh, there's a couple different ways that we can proceed. Uh, we can either kind of go from a top-down approach or from a bottoms-up approach. Either way, you want to make sure that you're standardized from one patient to the next such that you perform it in the same way with every single client or patient that's uh, seeking your services. Additionally, keep in mind that you're often going to want to assess the uninvolved side first and then move to the involved side. What this does is it enables you to establish your normative values such that you have a reference to compare that involved side to when you're going about your assessment. So in this case, we would presume that the individual has an involved right lower extremity hip, uh, either complaint, comparable sign, or pathology, and so we're going to start on the left-hand side. The first thing that I like to do is I like to screen any type of neural tension, and so we're going to start with a straight leg raise. The individual needs to be relaxed and then you're going to bring them up until you feel tension or you see a change in their facial expression. Now, uh, at this point, this should be a soft tissue stretch really through the hamstrings. Make sure that you're not locking out the knee or hyperextending the knee. That will just increase discomfort for your patient and oftentimes they'll complain of a burning sensation right behind the knee due to tension through those neurologic structures. You certainly can uh, complete some neural tension in this position as well if you want, but for today we're going to stick with passive range of motion assessment. Now once we get here, there's a couple of things we can do. We can take the goniometric assessment, looking at the horizontal to the hip, allowing the individual to relax, and then reading our measurement from there. Our stationary arm was in line with the trunk, our mobile arm is in line with the midline of the thigh, and if we do that, we find that this individual has approximately 68 degrees passive straight leg raise. So our normative values are somewhere around 65 to 70 degrees, and so this is functional, normal for this individual. Additionally, uh, we'll talk about in another video how you can assess hamstring length in a 90-90 position and then bring the individual up, taking it either from the vertical or the horizontal. And the only thing you have to be careful of there is how you report those measurements. So once you have straight leg raise completed, now you're ready to go through the rest of your assessment. We start with flexion, taking the individual up. If they're able to get to this level, I oftentimes don't record an actual measurement. The reason being is they're past not only functional range of motion, but also normal range of motion, okay? Uh, from here then, you can also assess overpressure or end fields with any of these. Next, we're going to move into external rotation, and if we really kind of push this individual, we can probably get more, but that's more of a capsular stretch then versus a true range of motion of the joint. So once we get to end range, we know that based on the end field, and it should be either capsular or hard as we get to that end range. We take our goniometer, our axis of rotation is midline, really axially through the femur. Our stationary arm is in the neutral position and our mobile arm is right along the tibial shaft and we have 41 degrees of internal rotation of the hip. Next we move to external rotation, we take the same measurement here, getting good with a one-handed measurement approach is really really handy. We 
you find 45 degrees external rotation, and that checks up. Typically at the hip, we get right around 90 degrees total arc. That, that value is 80 to 90 degrees. We have 41 internal, 45 external. It gives us a total arc of 86 degrees, and so that's a pretty normal arc of motion. Now, uh, we certainly can also look at adduction and abduction in this position. We can take the individual out. We can look at the ASIS as our stationary arm. Our mobile arm would be, again, midline of the thigh. We can record that value, which in this case, we're looking at about 47 degrees of hip abduction. And then we can also look at hip adduction where we actually come across. Now with that, note that if I do it here, I actually kind of have to come into slight flexion. And so how that is typically performed is you would have them move the other limb out of the way, slide all the way towards you on the table, and then take that range of motion measurement such that you stay in that horizontal plane, okay? So the only one then that we're missing still is extension. Now, extension is a hard range of motion measurement to get and take goniometric assessment at the exact same time. And there's really two ways that you can do this. And so for this assessment, we're gonna have the individual flip into a prone position for us. Obviously, we started on the left-hand side just so you can visualize this. I'm gonna to move to the right-hand side now at this point. But hip extension can either be assessed with the knee flexed or the knee extended, keeping in mind that we're dealing with some two joint muscles and soft tissue. With the knee flexed, you can get underneath that distal thigh a little bit further and you can take that individual into hip extension. Now, if an individual can achieve more than 10 to 15 degrees of hip extension, which would be right about there, meaning you're able to get them off the table, right? That's about as much as they need from a functional standpoint and normal standpoint, even in running, uh, which we consider to be more of a dynamic, explosive uh, type activity, really the individual doesn't need a whole lot of hip extension unless they're sprinting or doing some other form of really, really high level activity. You're not gonna need to assess that, that real uh, extreme of hip extension. So if you wanna try to get a goniometer on that, you certainly can, but recognize that it's gonna be challenging. Additionally, if external and internal rotation are a bit of a challenge when the individual is in a supine position, you can also assess internal and external rotation in a prone position, taking the individual out, looking for when the hip begins to rise on the contralateral side, and then you would take that range of motion measurement here with your stationary arm staying vertical, your mobile arm still following the shaft of the tibia. So you have a couple different options available to you. I prefer to look at internal and external rotation as well as flexion, all in that supine position. So have a go with a peer or colleague with passive range of motion assessment, overpressure end field, and goniometric assessment, and let me know if there's any questions.